and three equations for this guy, all right? So let's write it down. For system one, what are the equations? Summation of force in x zero, summation of force in y zero, summation of moment around any point is equal to zero. Again, we have three equations for system two, right? So let's go ahead and write the equations. So what is the summation of force in the x direction? So let's say the default value for the coordinate system, this is positive x goes to the right, and positive y goes to the upward. This is the default coordinate system. You can rotate it, align it with the body. You can do whatever you like. But usually, when we talk about x, y, this is my default axis. So what do I get for the first equation? Zero is equal to zero. As we said before, this is a normal equation. So we don't even bother writing it, all right? Now go to the next equation. What do I get for the next equation? I get T3 minus 60 times 981 is equal to zero. Now go to the third equation. What do I get for moments with respect to this center? It's a null equation, zero is equal to zero. It's not useful, so I don't write it. Even though it's valid, it is still right there, but it's zero <coughs> equal to zero. We still have the equation. It's valid, it we always have this. In 2D, 3D, we have these equations, right? But it's just a null, it's not useful, so we don't write it. Even though it's valid and we have it, right? So now let, let's go to system two, again, Summation of force in x zero, summation of force in y zero, summation of moment around any point is zero. This will give me P two cosine thirty five degree minus P one times one over five is equal to zero. The second equation will give me P two sine forty five plus P1, 3 over 5, minus P3 is equal to 0. And what about the moment equation? Let's say uh, this point O is my reference moment point. So what do I get for summation of moment around O? zero. All the force are going through that point. So I guess zero is equal to zero. So again, it's a null and null equation. So I don't write it. Eventually, the, the more practice you do, the better you understand how to skip things that are not necessary. You just go straight to the point, right? So this is all I get. Let's label the equation before we go to step four. So this is the equation. I check mark it on down. I wrote all possible equations. And now I'm ready to go to step four. But before that, let's label this. Let's say this is one, two, three. All right, now let's go to the step four. Solve the equation. So which one should I start with? One. Equation number one. It's one equation, one unknown. Right? Can I just start with this guy? No. It is one equation, and then you have one, two, three unknowns. What about this guy? No. One equation, two unknowns. So solve this equation. You get T3 is equal to six times 981. 60 times. So that's what you get. Now, what, what is my next equation? Well, if you go to two, right? Is exactly the same that if you go to three. 
Now here is the thing. I have some students that they stop here. So they, they, they get pretty much everything done here and then when you come here, they can't, they say, I can't solve it. I can't solve it. Because what they're expecting is, like the example we introduced in the previous class, that you always get a equation like that, just so simple to solve. So they're trying to get something for T2, and then solve for T2, and another thing for T3, for T1, right? But look, both of these equations, they are coupled, these are called coupled. They both have T1 and T2. Even, even though we got T3 here, but still look, we have one, two unknown. In this equation, one, two unknown in this equation. So we have a lot of students that they say, I can't solve it. And then I ask them, well, how come that, that is possible? Have you ever solved things like this before in high school? Like x minus y is one, two x plus y is zero. Have you ever solved things like that? And say, yeah, this is so easy, get y in terms of x and just plug it here, and then you get x and then you get y. That thing is called Gaussian elimination, that process. And then I said, well, what if x is t2 and y is t1? That's where you might say, oh, yeah, I'm so sorry, I'm sorry. I thought this is a something new in vector statement. No, this is the exactly the same thing. It's called system of simultaneous equations. So guys, I don't want any student to stop at this point. Don't, either don't write it, or if you come here, I really expect you guys to go ahead and solve it. If you stop here, that, that means something is terribly wrong, all right? So now let's do it. Let's say I want to find T3 first. I want to find T3 first. So what, I'm, what I need to do, sorry, I, I want to find T1 first. This is my first unknown that I want to find. We can either find T2 first or T1 first, right? So here in this case, I say, well, let's solve this guy, equation two, and get T2 in terms of T1, and then put it here, and we already have T3, so we can get T1, right? So let's do that. So from this equation, T2 is, T2, let's write here. T2 is equal to four over five, T1 over cosine, 45 degrees. 4 over 5, T1, cosine 45 degrees. So this is T2 from this equation 2. Now put it in equation 3. So T2 is equal to 4 over 5, T1, cosine 45 degrees, times this is T2 times sine 45 plus T1 times 3 over 5. This thing is equal to take T3 to the right, right hand side. And what was the value of T3? 5, 89. Right? So 588.6. Now, can I solve for T1? Yes, the answer is yes. Take out T1, factor it out. So if you take it out, you get one T1 from here, one T1 from here, T1 times this factor is 588.6. So T1 is equal to So look, here, sine 45 is equal to cosine 45. So they cancel out, right? Five over four plus three over five, uh, sorry, five over five, uh, four over five plus three over five. Four over five plus seven over five. Seven over five. So that, that's gonna be, <laughs> Seven over five, right? So
So T1 is equal to 588.6 times 5, hold on, multiply by 705. So that, that, that's uh, right. So basically what you do, T1 is equal to 705 times 5, 8, 8, 9, 6. So that's your T1. Then if you, you want to get T2, you just put it here. You get T2, right? And you already have T3. So your system is solved. Yeah. Would you not divide the seven over five out, and that would be the five over seven on the other side? So look, this one, they cancel out, right? So this goes with this. So you have four plus three is seven over five, right? So if you divide this by seven over five, that means you, you multiply by five over seven. Yeah, you, you multiply by five, over seven. When you divide this by seven over five, then this goes through all top, and then five over seven. Thank you. Five over seven multiplied by five hundred eighty-eight point six. So when you get T one, the numerical value you just put it here. You get T two, and so on. You get whatever value you replace, you get all of them. So now let's go. To another example, example number four five. Example four five. Here is your system. Now, the question is, find the reactions at point A and B as <coughs> an external reaction. So we have a, <coughs> we have a, we have a beam, this area, green area, and this area is pinned at point B. So you can move the beam from B, you just can't rotate it, right? Friction. And then, you put it on the slider, the roller, that really can easily slide in the X direction, but you can't move it in the Y. You can move it upward, but not down, right? 
So what we're then asking is to find the external reaction if you have this loading. So you can have one, two, three external load. Then what would be the reaction at point B or A? Or what are the support, the force in the support? So what do you do? Again, that is the procedure. That's what we did in the last class. So let's start with system. Which one should I choose as system? The B, right? So this guy, the beam is a very typical, but this includes everything that I want to relate to. All on the all the reactions, right? So I check mark it every time you do the steps. I just want to check mark it. System, you choose the system. Now you go to three by diagram. So here is my system, and I'm trying to find FED. Again, what should I do to find this FED? Two steps. Surface force, body force, right? You have to find surface force. You can point from here and start walking on this imaginary board that you see, and your point this isolated system is interacting with the outside board. So the first point you caught is this, this force. Do I know it? Yes. Yes, so just put it here. Don't introduce this unknown because you already know it, right? Here it was 600 Newton, and the angle is also bigger. Continue walking. The next thing you caught, 200 Newton. Let's put it here, because you know it, right? The next thing you caught is the pin. In fact, this dotted line, it goes all around it's like a 3D wrap around the object. It's go all around this pin and it's separate, separating it from this connection. So how many force and moment do I have at B? Two. Two. One force in the X direction. So if that's the center, one force in the X direction. And because I don't know it, I just say DX, X component at B. Because I don't know it. That's actually what I'm trying to find. Right? Now you have another component here, BY. The Y component at B, and I don't know it. Do I have a moment at B? No. Because what? Because you can easily rotate this beam around B. There is no friction, no external moment that can counter your the force, your torque. If you apply a torque here, there's nothing external that can have a uh, you know, counter moment to cancel your torque. So there is no moment here. You only have X and Y. In order to find this force in general case, regardless if you are doing 2D, 3D, or any connection, ask the question, can I move it in X? If the answer is yes, like this part, you see if you only had this connection, you can easily Move it next, it's a slider. So there is no FX, no unknown force there. There is no force there to resist. But look here, in the pin, you can't move because it's pinned here. So you have an unknown DX. Similarly, you say, can I move it in Y? No, so you have unknown force in Y. Can I move it in Z? Then you go to moment. Can I rotate it about x axis? Can I rotate it about y axis? Can I rotate it about z axis? If the answer is no, then you have to put moment there. All right, so this is what I get at point B. Continue walking. The next thing you call is this under Newton force this way at this distance, two meter, right? Which is acting at this point. Right? And I continue walking. Now the next thing you caught is this slider, which which is fixed to this point. Alright? So how many force of moments do I have there? 
see. And this one. And this one. See. And this one. And this one. See. Because look, you don't have an x component, ax is zero. But you have a y, something that keep it from falling. You know, this is support, this is lawyer. <coughs> so you put an ay here. <coughs> And you don't have a moment because again you can easily rotate on this thing. All right, so you get only a y. Now you go back to your start point. Always put the sign on your start point because if you have a lot of moment distribution, you get lost. But if you have a check mark, you see that cross here. That means your, your original start point. Now I'm back to my start point, so I'm done with the surface force. What about the body force? Let's say the beam, the mass of beam is just too small. All right? So I don't have a body force. So that's my FPD, step number two. All right, but let's go and check on it. So this is my FPD. Now let's go to equation. <coughs> so I only have <coughs> one system. So how many equations do I get? Three. Three, summation of force in x zero, summation of force in y zero, summation of moment around any point is zero. For the first equation, I get 600 cosine 45 positive sign. This is negative y, y, and y. So, plus ex. So Bx from here, this is in y, 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 this is y, plus 600 cosine 45 is equal to zero. Now you go to y direction. So you get negative 200 plus by, negative 200, negative 600 sine 45 degree plus ay is equal to zero, all right? Now you go to moment equation. What point should I choose as my reference point for moment equation? B, who said B? Somebody said B. You did? Good job. Why we do B? Why I didn't do it like this point or this point? Well, the trick is you try to choose a point that the maximum number of unknown forces, not known forces, the maximum number of unknown forces are passing through that point. So this is the trick. Choose a reference point for moment equation such that the maximum number of unknown forces are going through that point, or they are concurrent through that point. So why we do that? Because if all of unknown forces, not all, but maximum number of, let's say this F1, F2, and this is F3, and some other forces, they are all going through this point, right? So if I write the moment equation or that point, I don't waste my time to include this unknown into the equation, and I get a longer equation, and I get a longer solution methodology. So I only get the one that are not that are known, or probably maximum one unknown. So I can just get one beautiful, one equation, one unknown, and then I can solve it in one shot. And no matter how complicated the system is, usually there is a way to choose a point that most of the force are going through that point. So you get a nice beautiful, a small single equation, single unknown, and you can solve for that. Right? So, Point B is the point that you can see there are two unknowns going through point B. Point A, only I have one unknown. I could use this as a reference point for my moment equation, but I prefer to use this because this gives me more simplification, right? So sum of moment on point B should be zero. So let's start with this guy, what do I get? Moments of this around B. What is it? Zero. Zero. 
Now we go to this guy. <coughs> Moment of this with respect to point B. Zero. This guy. Zero. What about this guy? Then we have three steps. Break it down, move it, get the moment of and compute, right? So it's already decomposed, it's in the Y. So the next step, move it, move it up, right? So if you move it here, what's your moment of? Two. two. So moment of two times, value of force, 100, positive or negative? Positive, right? You see that? Now go to the next one. What about this guy? Now blue is doing right. What about the moment of this force, 600? What should I do? I want to calculate moment of 600 with respect to point B. What should I do? Break it up. Break it up, move, find the moment of. So if I break it up, this is going to be 600 sine 45, this way, and this component, x component is going to be 600 cosine 45, right? It's not you, move it. Where should I move this guy? Down, right here. So what's the moment arm? From here to here is going what? Five. Five times. Five times. Six hundred sine forty-five. Six hundred sine forty-five. Positive or negative? Positive. Positive. Now let's go to this guy. Where should I move it? Right here. So what's your moment arm? Point two, this distance, you see that? Mm. Point two times 600 cosine 45. Positive or negative? Negative. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Now let's go to this guy. This is already perpendicular to this position vector. So the moment arm is uh, seven. seven times a y a y positive or negative? Negative. Is equal to zero. So I have my three equations because I only have one system. So three equations. Now if this was in three D, how many equations could I have? Six. 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 Summation of force in x zero. Summation of force in y zero. Summation of force in zero. And then you go to moment. Summation of moment of about axis x0, summation of moment of axis y0, summation of moment of axis z0. Here we only have one axis z that goes through point b. That's the reason why we only have one moment equation. In fact, the other moment equation are still valid. You still have the six equations, but they are zero is equal to zero. Zero is equal to zero, no. So we just pick the three one, three possible equations, right? Now, Let's go and solve it. Now we got the equation. Let's go back and check mark. This is the most important part, being organized and trying to do it in a systematic way. I'm not interested in the final numerical answer. That doesn't matter at all to me. I'm trying in your thought process. So I'll put the check mark here. Now I want to do solve. So which one should I start with? First. Yeah, either, let's say this is one, two, three, right? I can either do equation number three or equation number one. As you can see, I cannot start with equation number two. Why? Because it has four unknowns, a y, b y, and it's only one equation. So somehow I should either get b y or a y and put it here and solve for the other one. But this guy is only 
one equation, one unknown. So if you solve this, you get dx, which is negative 600 cosine 44, five. Now, if you solve ay, what do you get? Ay, what do you get? The reaction here. So let's say when I start giving you this problem in the test or quiz or exam, whatever, if I ask you, find, find the reaction at point A. Let's say this is the question, right? I give you this picture, and that's the question. Then, practically, it is possible that you solve this with one line. You see that? But look, you have to go, you have to exercise. You have to get ready for this. Right now, don't try to go to one line approach. Try to go in all five steps and make sure it makes your brain to be, uh, you know, uh, <coughs> organized. <coughs> you, you solve in a very systematic way. But once you practice a lot, then you can just immediately go to this equation without drawing pre-wide diagram, without drawing, without writing all these two equations. In fact, you don't need to write all these equations. You don't need to base it on. You can just start from here. Because if you choose this point here as your reference point, you know that all the unknown here goes away. And you have only one unknown. One known is equal to one unknown, then you can just solve from here. In fact, in the first section, I had one student, I put like an interpreter, and I had one student, he came in, and he got his initial grade base. He, did, he, he started writing this, I said, solve this problem with one line. And then he started writing this equation. And I said, okay, you're done. Right? You get 100 in the midterm. So soon, we reach a point that I ask you to solve this problem with one line. Right? Because as engineers, as an engineer, you don't want to waste the time. Right? You don't, we want to minimize the number of computation. We don't want to do determinant like cross product. You remember midterm exam number three? That's what I, the, the thing I was expecting was not to do the de determinant because you need to do it the method of moving forces. Break the component, move, get the momentum, and add it to the corresponding axis. That would give you a one line solution. Although I had a lot of the students doing determinant, and that would was like a two pages solution. And it was most of them, I would say, the determinant like was like 95% wrong, the students. I only had like two, one, one or two students who got the determinant right in the entire three-section class. So that, that's what I'm saying. You will reach to this point that you just solve it with one line, but not right now. Right now, let's just be very fundamentalist. Practice in a very organized way. Five step. Always do the five step. Always write it down. Always check mark it. Always go through drawing three by diagram. I want to see your three by diagram. When, when you solve a quick problem here, right now, I want to see your final three by diagram in the homeworks. Like if you have a problem you solve something, I want to see your three by diagram. So that's it for today.